What about these guys? These guys are good looking. You can take pictures of them. So um, I think we'll just kind of get this thing kicked off. Uh, my name is Jeffrey Moore, and the panel's uh, Digital 2.0. Um, let me, I'd like to set the context, take a couple minutes to set the context of the panel, and then I'm going to engage with some pretty wonderful people. Um, a lot of the technology panels that I've been involved with, both at Davos and elsewhere, uh, people from the tech sector kind of sit up on the dais, and they talk about the latest, greatest, most exciting, hottest thing in the sector. And the goal is always to be, let's, let's expand the awareness of people that aren't in the sector about what's really great going on. That isn't a big need anymore. In case, we're getting a lot of publicity right now for the sector. That's not, that's not as a big a need, I think, as to establish a common vocabulary and a common understanding of how the tech sector is unfolding in the rest of this decade and what it's going to mean for everyone in this room. And I think there's two things that make this particularly apropos to talk about now. One is, over the last 10 years, the, when I first got involved in the technology sector, it was a relatively isolated part of the economy. It had very peculiar dynamics, but it was, they tended to stay within tech. And most of the value of tech was captured by tech companies. I mean, the customer base now overwhelmingly is the most important beneficiary of the tech world. And, and it is tech is not just tech, it's tech and telco and financial services and now media and advertising and pharma and retail and supply chain and logistics. So it's a much, much broader footprint. And the need for a more broad and common understanding of what's going on so that we can operate effectively together is high. The second thing I'd like to point out is for most of my life in the tech sector, you could understand a lot about the dynamics of what was going on by just appreciating what Moore's Law was doing. Now, this was the real Moore. This was Gordon Moore. So, so, so he, he, what would happen is every five to seven years, you'd get a 10 to 100x improvement in the underlying capability of computing. And when you do that, it would obsolete whatever design rules were in place when you designed the last generation of capability. And so you would literally swap out entire infrastructures because it was just so much better. And, you know, if we think about the, 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 the positive dynamic between Microsoft and Intel through the PC industry, but, but, but also the mini computers, the workstations, the CAD software, all this kind of stuff. About six or seven or eight years ago, Moore's law didn't stop applying. It still applies today. But it stopped explaining as much. And particularly in this, in, in, since, the, since the year 2000, a lot is happening in tech, and Moore's Law just doesn't seem to be as central. So my goal today is to, is to help us deepen our understanding, well, if it's not Moore's Law, then what are we supposed to focus on to understand what's happening? And I've got, a, I've got sort of a Davos dream team to help me out. Uh, obviously, Bill and John need no introduction. They've helped this forum understand the tech sector for the better part of the last decade. Um, Eric Schmidt on my immediate left might be a newer face. I don't think we could ever suggest his company has been underpublicized, so I think you probably probably know Google. Um, but the true new face here at the, at the end is Nicholas Sendstrom, who is the CEO and co-founder of Skype Technologies, which is an internet telephony capability that uh, uh, has sort of set the world on fire and, and was recently acquired by eBay for a price somewhere between 2.5 and $4 billion, depending on how well Nicholas and his colleagues do over the next few years. So it's a wonderful group of people to, to address. And I'm going to start with Bill, and I'm going to start with the, the, what I think is the key question to get us down this path. So Bill, and I'm going to ask this question, by the way, to each of my panelists. There are so many trend lines to follow in the IT sector. What, in your view, is the single most important trend in the sector today, and, and what are you doing to align Microsoft with that trend? Well, certainly, I, I think the easiest way to understand the new developments is to think of computing power and storage as almost free, and say to yourself, what are the, the limiting factors that are, are left? Uh, ease of management, ease of development, ease of a user working with multiple devices, and then take this idea of digitization and map it against all the activities that we'd like to change. You know, 10 years ago, uh, people would have known that, that digitization was going to change email and photos. They might not have said it was going to change TV and create the idea of personalized TV because that's just an emerging thing. Uh, we would have said it was going to change reading. We haven't done that yet with tablets and uh, annotation, note-taking, things like that, but with the right 
device form factor with the magic of, of hardware that's coming along, that quest, that scenario, and all of those will, will get solved. Eventually, you move from isolated scenarios around things like photos and music and video to broader scenarios about uh, all your, your memories of your kids growing up and how you access and navigate those. Communication is one where you move from just thinking of voice being cheap to thinking of collaboration, notification, uh, working together in a, a very diff different way. Taking what happened on the desktop with, you could say, individual productivity and revolutionizing group productivity. Uh, group productivity has been characterized largely by some higher price, lower volume products. There's no sort of standard thing like offices on the desktop and that, uh, that's about to change. So broadly, it's taking all those activities at work, digital work style, at home, digital lifestyle, and thinking through how infinite hardware ability with a little bit of, of software actually can do those things and then applying the test of is it simple enough, is it uh, uh, packaged up in a way that people can understand it. Has that caused you, as, as this has come into f uh, prominence over the last few years, has it caused you to rethink the way you're aligning Microsoft or organizing Microsoft going forward? No, not really. Uh, you know, when we wrote down the Microsoft research agenda, when we first got to be a big enough company, uh, which is now 16 years ago, to really invest in research that we now do in you know, wherever there's a billion people, we have a research center. The kinds of things we wrote down in terms of speech recognition, visual recognition, uh, security, automated management, so you don't need uh, the IT personnel, uh, model-based programming, so you don't write as many lines of code. I'd say that those dreams are still there. There's a few, like the reading dream, that haven't happened. The TV dream took longer than we expected. Some happen, you know, Without our help, the music thing uh, happened, and so we'll have to contribute to phase two. You, you guys have been uh, pretty good at catching. You've been pretty good at catching up. This is, you're not too bad at that. <laughs> yeah, we we prefer, uh, you know, with the original PC or productivity or things like that to not catch up. Uh, but when it's necessary, uh, it's a good skill to have. No, it's <laughs> it's, it's true. I mean. That, that, it is probably the core skill. Um, I'm going to come back to Bill, but I kind of want to just sort of start g getting the, the, the landscape uh, uh, continue to light. So I'm going to turn it over to John now. So John, again, the, the question is, you know, looking at the tech sector, all these trends, what's the trend that you think is the most important one to track to, and how are you aligning Cisco with, with that trend? I think catching market transitions and then understanding how to apply technology to them is key to each of our success or lack of it. I think the most basic market transition going on today is moving from transactions, a single Google search uh, or a single order entry, et cetera, to an interactions, whether it's the retail clerk uh, helping the person on the floor, no longer is checking you out, et cetera. And what is enables this is actually Moore's Law continuation. A lot of the basic principles in high tech never go away. Moore's Law allowed the performance, as, as Jeffrey said, to double you know, every 18 months. Uh, ten factor in five years, and Moore's law is alive and healthy not only where Bill said in processors and storage, but I would argue that the microprocessor drove Moore's law for the thir first 35 years. I'd say it's networked IT that will drive it for the next 35. So you can anticipate things coming down in price at tremendous pace. You changed also with data, voice, video, and mobility convergence. All of a sudden, that allowed us to both move from transactions in these modes to interactions in ways that enabled new business models or new entertainment models. So I think it is that transactions to interactions base, but also the uh, price performance of Moore's Law enabling these So I want to push a little at that phrase, transactions to interactions, because a lot of us in this room do transactions and have interactions. Um, what do you think the impact of that is and how, if you were you know, leading a, a technology-enabled business, what should I be thinking about as I'm thinking about this transition? Well, if you're a company that is looking for productivity, it allows what we said seven or eight years ago when most people wouldn't buy into it, that productivity shouldn't grow at one or two percent per year, but three to five percent per year as a country and five to ten as a company. If you're going to interact with your customers differently, that gives you huge competitive advantage, productivity, and differentiation. If you're going to interact internally in terms of how you build products across multiple BUs with customer advocacy, et cetera, it allows a speed of give and take that uh, 
uh, gives you, again, the next wave of productivity. From Eric's point of view, it might be how the consumer interacts or collaborates together. Okay, fair enough. Well, I'm, I'm going to turn to Eric. So, again, just to get the, the, these points of view on the, on the board here. Eric, again, the question being lots of trends. What's the one that, that you think is the one to, to, to focus on directly, and how are you aligning Google with that trend? Well, I certainly agree with what both Bill and John said. Um, something has happened in the last year or so. The technology that we've worked on for so many years, we've had demos of much of this for a long, long time, has hit some kind of a critical mass. We finally figured out a way to get all the networks to work together. We finally figured out a way to make some consumer devices that were very powerful. So as a result of the combination of all of these, and plus making them easy to use by sort of normal people as opposed to ourselves in the industry, um, all of a sudden, the, the, the rate of growth that is most interesting to me are people who are using this new technology to change businesses, literally to drive new markets, to create new industries. Uh, so a number of metrics, for example, that you might look at include the rate at which people are taking traditional businesses and making their services available online, and now they have a way of doing it and make, to make money, not just defensively, but in, fa in fact as part of their business strategy. And they also, in many cases, use it to, to gain many, many new customers. So we've talked for a long time about e-commerce and the internet, and everyone's heard those, mem those messages many times. Now the difference is there, not only is it mission critical, but it's in fact a, a, a set of tools that will allow you to build million-person businesses very, very quickly. So, yeah, that, 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 so what are you doing to align Google with the capability? I mean, I do think that's part of, the, of, of, of what's dramatically new in the last five to X years, which is that a startup could access, I mean, just, Nicholas, just as a data point, and I'll get to you in a moment, how many, how many years has Skype been in existence? About three and a half years. Three and a half years. How many registered subscribers do you have today? About 75 million. 75 million customers in three and a half years. We talk about a friction-free world. Two and a half years into the launch right. service. Right. 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 So, so, <laughs> so it, that, it, Bill, it took Bill longer to get 75, didn't it? Take you longer? Well, what's a customer? Is it somebody who pays you? Or <laughs> oh, oh, good point, good point. So, so this, this, we, we could get to an issue here fairly quickly. So how many of the 75, no, this is a, how many of the 75 million customers pay you some amount of money? So the interesting thing here is that, and as what was Bill said, that you have to think about um, the um, technology or, or the incremental cost for a new user a new transaction, a new telephone call over the internet is virtually free. So it doesn't really matter from a cost point of view if you have a lot of people, a lot of users who are not paying for your service because it doesn't cost you any money. But it creates a great ecosystem, a network of people who are then spreading your services to others. So um, we don't really think of like how, um, you know, as a traditional think, think telecom company, think about the average revenue per users. We don't think about that. We think about how many active uses we have, and then how we can convert those to paying customers. Okay, I'm going to come back to this, because this is, I think, is a, there's a fundamental sea change in business model going on, but I'm going to get back to, to Eric here and then to Nicholas, and I'll bet we'll have a pretty good dialogue here in a minute. Um, so, so, so what are you doing to align Google with the, the fact that these hyperscale markets are now relatively available semi-instantaneously? Well, Google is, Google's customer is its end user. And what we do is we focus on end user value. And we don't necessarily know exactly what you end users want, and so we figured out ways of sort of managing innovation at scale. And so I think the secret in these new models is that you have to move very, very quickly. So you have to take these teams of technical people, you have to keep trying things. We run the company on a set of principles around 70% in our core businesses, 30%, 20% in adjacent businesses, 10% in other, other new areas. Engineers have 20% of their time free to experiment in new ideas. Many of our new products come from that free time. So one of the issues about these scale businesses is that you have to have a principle, in our case it's end user value, and the second is that you have, a, you have to have a culture and a structure of innovation uh, that is continuous, because we cannot predict the future, but we know that we're sort of in the middle of it and we keep trying different scenarios. What is most interesting has been that with a focus on end users, we were also able to find some very, very good monetization strategies, which had heretofore eluded many companies. And, and I would argue as an outsider that virtually, at least all the monetization strategies I've seen to date are essentially media monet. I mean, I would argue from an economic point, you look a lot like a media company, not a, 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 a technology company. Is that fair or, or am I missing something? Well, the majority of our revenue comes from advertising, um, and that may or may not, continu may or may not continue. The important thing is that people need to be compensated for their intellectual property. So you, you need you some that, mechanism. <laughs> you, 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 you need some, you, you need right. some mechanism, yeah, yeah, yeah. right, to make the value work, 
to get people to advertise, to sell products, to make e-commerce works, and so forth. Advertising has turned out to be a gold mine. There are other models probable, right? So various forms of subscription, various forms of pay-per-view, et cetera. Right. Okay. But John, Jeff, you got your I'm, hand I'm up. I'm going to comment on that because I think what Eric said was it, it's so easy to blow past us without understanding the implications of it. Our industry is used to using IT or networked IT to enable our strategy. What is now starting to happen across all industries is technology not only enables the strategy, it drives the change and maybe even cause the change. So I would argue that Eric is using technology really to change multiple segments of the industry. And that's what we all attempt to do to gain competitive advantage. Yeah, I mean, uh, from a marketing guy's point of view, just the customer acquisition, and I, 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 I want to come back to Bill's point about what do you mean by a customer, but, but at least the participants the, the participants' interaction is, is this extraordinary thing. So I will turn to Nicholas now. So Nicholas, if you're looking at this issue of trend, what do you think is the number one trend in, in the sector? And how are you working to align Skype or now Skype plus eBay with that trend? So I guess one of the things that, that I see is a, a big thing is that, you know, this is a word that we've always been using for a long time, but ubiquity. That the internet is starting now to finally become this one global ubiquity net network. And it's becoming mobile as well with you know, emergence of more and more Wi-Fi access points. The mobile network starting to have um, broadband uh, or at least limited broadband internet access. And there's so many people now connected to the internet. At the same time, there are so many technologies, as Eric said, we started now, we actually got the networks to work together and, and, and the technology is working. And it becomes very easy for different technologies to hook in together without having a big integration project, it's just different um, technology companies have different APIs and um, developers are very easy to use to, to integrate these technologies. And this enables small companies anywhere in the world to make very big impacts because they don't need to create everything themselves. They don't need to create um, all the infrastructure, the technologies behind because it's already available to tap into. So you can have a small company focus on one single problem and if they solve that and take advantage of underlying technologies, if that is, you know, if that is, you know, uh, different web technologies or whatsoever, they can, with very, very little resources, make a very significant impact. And they don't need to be understand how these other technologies work. They can just focus on this their own thing. And that means that you can, you will have small startups that have very, very big impacts. And once they get it right. Um, those services would just spread like wildfire over the internet and we talked about customer acquisition cost and vir virtually zero customer acquisition cost and I think Skype was a good example of that because we've been growing very very fast we solved one problem and we didn't have to care about how the Cisco routers worked or how the operating systems work we could only f focus on solving how people can connect and make uh, a voice call so, 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 Nicholas, as, as you're looking, and I, I, I want to get to your business model because I think it, it's an interesting part of this whole um, uh, change thing. You have 75 million registered users. You get paid, I think, primarily when somebody makes a call off of the net onto a, onto a, a, a wireline or, or a paid subscriber. What percentage of the 75 million are doing that? So that's a single digit percentage. Okay, so, so but, but, but your argument would be, you know, if, if, I, if I get X percent where X is less than 10, that may be an acceptable business That's model. That's great. It's, it's actually very similar to, to what Google has because how many of the searches results in, in revenues? And I guess that the number of searches where, uh, pages where someone clicks on an ad word is also a single digit. So it's very, actually quite similar where most of the transactions or, or interactions, whatever you call it, are not revenue generating, but that's fine because the cost, the underlying marginal cost is virtually zero. Well, somebody is bearing that cost, which may get to, to, to well, Bill, you've, you've uh, articulated a point of view on this. Do you, do you want to speak to these business models or how do you see them impacting the sector going forward or the, or the folks in the audience? Well, I think that it's a very valuable business model. I do think inside a company, you've got to have good terminology about users versus customers. You know, in that three and a half years, we added 200 million Hotmail customers, 200 million Messenger customers, uh, if you use that word. We say users. Okay, uh, all right. Well, it's, we, I think it's, I think it's important to do users. users as well. Okay, I yeah, think we okay. should use users yeah. versus customers. Okay. Uh, when they start paying us, that's a subset. And so it's neat. You can have some people who are about driving up the number of users, and then other people who think, okay, what can we, to the degree that's an asset, how can we convert those people over? 
And I do think that's absolutely uh, an important model because scale is important and having a free offering at the base allows people to get in, to get used to your product. And you're seeing it with virtually every product nowadays. You see it with databases. We have a free database and then if you want the fancy one, uh, yeah, right. you, you pay a little you bit should. more. Uh, and we've seen this with media players and browsers and a lot of the elements of the system because people want a user base basically of uh, you know, three, four hundred million. I, and I know that you tease about, about uh, comp companies in Asia, particularly China or India, who have gotten a lot of Microsoft software for free, but isn't that, again, a version of at least getting users and then at some point converting up, up to customers? Absolutely. The terminology is very important in that case. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, Jeffrey? Yeah, yeah, yeah please. You, you want to you distinguish between seeding strategies and fundamental business models. A seeding strategy is where you give stuff away for a while and then eventually you upconvert them because they're, 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 they're critical or so forth and so on. The internet allows for models which, where the majority of the use is in fact free or subsidized by others in some interesting way. And the specialized use, even on small percentages, is so large right, that it produces enough money to, to su subsidize, if you will, the overall operation. And in that sense, these businesses have built up a lot of goodwill. One of the ways in which you can create great brands right, is by doing that. And in fact, many people are now funding companies without a particularly clear business model, but with a, um, a goal of getting a very large number of users very quickly. Uh, and in many Including, ways, this is... Wouldn't, wouldn't you argue that that's what Google did originally? Well, it, Google set out to solve the search problem and but, discovered the advertising model a couple of iterations around, and it has worked out very well, of course. Uh, in, 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 the, in the coming years, there will be more companies that will figure out a way to get a piece of people's attention. And in this next generation of people living online, we're all fighting about end user time, right? How are people gonna spend their time? They're gonna have software that runs on all the platforms. Everything's gonna work together. They want everything now and they want it in the, in, with a brand and a service and so forth. And that's why the focus on end users is so important. Do you think that, do you, would you apply John's notion of transaction to interaction as a place that you would be taking the Google customer base over the next you know, several years? I mean, if I think of search right now, I do think of it as a transaction more than as an interaction. But are, you, are, are more of the experiences going forward going to be more? I, I think they all become more integrated. And um, one of the tricks here is to make the whole user adoption, advertiser buy cycle quicker, which all the companies are doing. And we're certainly trying to help there. Um, the thing that's interesting is that people are not failing to buy things. They're just using a different mechanism. And we in the industry spent many, many years talking about this, but our systems were very, very hard to use. So the key, the key idea here is to make it one click, the sort of the Amazon model, if you will, of a single click buyout, which they pioneered. And I, and I would argue now that is available. One click is available to all businesses, not just to a specialized yes, few. Course. So John, let me ask you something, because you know, implicit in, in, this, in this model is a somewhat subsidized international network and and the folks that actually put that cable in the ground and and, and tried to make money from that the, the 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 wireline carriers and the and the other extended carriers uh, are beginning to make noises as they often do by saying hey wait a minute this is this is this is our you're, you're using my my railroads for your cars and you're not paying me anything you interact a lot with that sector at, at Cisco where do you think that's going to go is that going to is that going to continue to just be a grumble or do you think that that's going to result in in some change in the model going forward well I, I personally believe going back to the Moore's law comments and also just thinking about how quickly the scale is going to occur that bandwidth will be relatively free so pure transport will have commodity-like behavior, not only voice, but also data and video. And I would think of the audience maybe in two groups. I would think of business customers and consumers. The behavior is a little bit different on those. The biggest issue I face with business customers on technology is talk about how you're going to combine this technology, you know, layers one through seven in the OSI stack, and then how do you change your business model? So I spend as much time with our customers now talking about business model enablement and how technology is going to drive their strategy in the future or actually determine their strategy as I do on the technology side. So I want to follow up with that. So as you consult as a trusted advisor to some of the businesses about business model enablement, what are the business model changes that you're beginning to see? I mean, what can you can, can give us some examples of clients of whether it's of Cisco or, or, or anyone in the networking industry that, that are that are making business model changes that we can use as a frame of reference for this idea? Well, one that's very easy identifiable, and then I'll use an example of how it changes an industry in a different category, is how you view the media. 
uh, how you would view the media originally in a printed magazine type approach or daily periodical, then you view it over the internet, now you view it as blogging. Those transitions and all the implications with it have tremendous implications about who wins and where the profit goes. Just a week ago, we did a demonstration with Bob Nardelli from Home Depot. And he talked about where he saw the retail industry going in terms of how he had used technology, everything from your home to how he applied his resources to how he identified you in the store to RFID capability. And he basically said, here's how I use technology to not only enable every element of my business strategy, technology changes actually determine my business strategy. So it's the ability to take these techie terms, if you will, and really be able to put it into practical business implication. Same thing is true in healthcare, same thing is true in education, and in, in, in a different way, same thing is true with the consumer. And in all of those, I mean, healthcare and, and, and education in particular and customer service, they're highly interact. Back to your thing about interaction, not rather than transaction. I mean, the transaction was the ATM machine, it, it was the, the airline ticket, but these are I mean, I assume Bob's thinking about interactions, not just transactions. Correct. But if, if what you're seeing, let's use healthcare as an example, is that the future of a country and their ability to implement healthcare changes or other productivity issues are based on education, based upon their infrastructure build out. It used to be highways, which, by the way, the country would usually pay for over time, right. and then allow everybody to get the benefits of it. Today, it's broadband implementation, both fixed and wireless. It is creating an environment of innovation, and it's supporting government to enable that. And so if you think about healthcare in terms of that, it requires all four of those working effectively together. So, so Bill, in terms of the, this notion of bandwidth becomes free, because when, when I started in, in, in computing, we, the, the network was always kind of the very shallow pipe, and it was always trade-offs between you know, the computer and the CPU and the I.O. But, but as bandwidth becomes free, how does that change the value proposition at Microsoft or the, or the playing field for you in terms of either opportunity or threat? No, oh, I'm Jeffrey, sorry. I think it's important when you talk about something commoditized or becoming free. Transport has commodity-like behaviors and will become free. The services that you deliver on that for the service providers or for us in this room right. will not be. We'll learn how right. to charge for those we go through it. Sorry to interrupt you. Um, no, so it's great. But, but, yeah. Well, l last mile transport is not going to become free. You're, there's huge investments that need to be made there. There's, you know, getting $30 a month from an increasing number of people is a very, very good business. And uh, so that's why we're seeing the investments in the build-out. Uh, in the backbone, yes, we had the commoditization of that, what, eight years ago. So the, the new business model for a network operator involves taking things like a video service where they package up video that you would have seen come from, say, satellite, or another, uh, the cable network operator, and get that as a value-added revenue stream. Uh, and they're able to do it as a uh, sort of breakthrough video experience where it's personalized advertising, it's, you know, when you watch the news show, you're only watching the subjects that you've chosen that are of interest. Sports, game shows are very different because you have this individual video feed that's going to that user. And so it's a leapfrog ahead of all the existing video models, and yet the network operator is the one who knows how to provision and get that to critical mass in their territory. And how are you aligning, uh, is, is, how is Microsoft, or does Microsoft intend to participate in that particular business model, and if so, how? Well, we're, we're the software provider to uh, AT&T, Verizon, Bell, South Bell, Canada, uh, Deutsche Telekom, British Telecom, Reliance, the people who are pioneering uh, those things are using Microsoft software to do it. Now, it's their customer, they control the user interface, they go out and get the video, but we're making it so that this idea of authoring up the guide and personalizing the advertising, that's just very straightforward for them as a, a way of getting network return. Okay. And one other thing I still have here, so digitization, we started talking about digitization and, and how so much is becoming digitized. I, I don't know if it was 10 years ago or whatever, but I know there was a time when um, the, uh, you became very visible for your investments in, in, in images, in, in image libraries and whatnot. Whatever, where is that and where, where, does it have a key role to play going forward? Well, the, there's a, a modest-sized industry that uh, Getty Images and Corbus are the two by far leading companies in where you can go out and get great photography and uh, historical or uh, advertising type photography. And those are just good examples of businesses where the internet has completely revolutionized it. They used to duplicate these prints and send them with people running around and lose all those things. Now it's just a website and you can get various rights. If you're a consumer, it's priced 
very differently than if you're, say, Time Magazine coming in to get those. So it's a, uh, you know, it's done quite well, but not by the scale of the, the companies represented here. Right, right. So, so Eric, and I'm, as you're looking forward and looking for, I mean, I think everybody here knows you for search. We, we know about uh, the advertising model of going to search. What do you think are some of these next things that are coming down the pike and some of these experiments? Can you, can you kind of report out on early returns? Well, we set out the mission of organizing all the world's information, and, and all the world's information means all of it. And it's, it, it, there's a lot that is still not available on the Internet or is difficult to find. So the most immediate thing people will see will be a lot more content, and you're obviously organizing that, finding it, and so forth and so on. Many of the people have been hesitant to put their information onto the Internet broadly because they have been afraid of it being stolen, there hasn't been appropriate digital rights management, those kinds of things. Um, Google and a number of other companies as well have built frameworks that allow you to essentially, as a publisher of information, decide the terms with which you would like to make your offering. You can rent it, you can own it, you can lease it, what have you. This is the price point, it's high, it's low, it's a subscription. Um, so the most, uh, we're spending a lot of time trying to make that part of the framework work to enable things like the special image banks that Bill was talking about become more generally available. People who are cognoscenti know about them, but the average person is unlikely to encounter them. I, I can remember, you know, four or five years ago, digital rights management was one of those phrases that was going through and trying to figure out when are we going to get that right. Where do you think the digital rights management infrastructure is today? And, in, in relative to where it needs to be to, in order to make this vision, you know. Well, the, the panelists may, may disagree with my view on this. Uh, it, I don't think it's been solved yet. Uh, most of the digital rights management solutions, the really, really uh, strong ones, are too complicated to use. And the really, really simple ones have not had broad adoption. Um, it turns out that the content industries represented here at the conference uh, and the ones we deal with all the time it really do need this problem solved, and they need it solved in a way that's easy for end users to use and is worldwide available. If, if, if such solutions are evolved, you know, developed and, and broadly adopted, then there's likely to be a huge growth in revenue for those companies because the product's already ready. The infrastructure is already ready. So the content is ready, the infrastructure is ready, the customer demand is there. Now we have to open the door. So do either of you have a point of view about digital rights management in terms of where it is and where it is relative to where it needs to be? Well, it's certainly no, not where it needs to be in terms of having uh, the kind of interoperability, uh, the kind of simple rights models uh, that people can understand exactly what they're allowed to do, what they're not allowed to do. And the content owners have been holding back, which has actually led to a lot of things being out there with no rights envelope at all, simply uh, put out onto the Internet. So. We're spending a lot of time with the media companies making sure they know that the, the technology is going to do its best to protect these things, uh, giving them some flexibility of the models, and yet making it simple enough that users can understand what needs to be done. The DRM problem is not in good shape until every uh, video show and song that you want is easily available on all your devices. And you buy it once, and it shows up on those devices. And you understand, can you lend it to somebody? Can you use it? on, on an, another device without uh, paying extra for that, and we are not there. We're putting a ton of time into that problem, so I'd hope, hope for some progress over the next few years. Music is further along, but even there, some of the tough issues about usage models are, are not solved. Fair enough. And, and does Cisco have a role to play in this, John? Well, I, I think the, the larger issue here is that by the time something becomes obvious to everyone, it's too late. So whether the, you're the content providers or the implementers of distributing that, et cetera, you've got to anticipate where the market is three to five years out. And that's one of the toughest things to do. And one of the neat things about the World Economic Forum and our various IT and service provider breakouts, it was the ability to go back and forth on those issues. And I think Ben uh, said it best from BT. He said, I have to decide now where I think I'll be three to five years out and position myself for that. So I think we will solve those issues and have multiple ways of implementing it. So you've got to decide your business model well before they're finally solved and then say, now that it's solved, let me think about how I'm going to distribute it, how I'll make profit in this new model. Okay. I want to go back to Nicholas um, because 
it, Nicholas Skype, I think, had this, it captured everyone's imagination. It's now part of eBay. So I, I, if there ever was kind of a, a, an image of the convergence of communications and transactions, you know, computing transactions and, and communications, boy, that sounds like it. What, what is the vision at eBay for the role that uh, a Skype-enabled eBay w w would play in the world? Or how, how would that be a different, a different world? So, you know, um, eBay set out to um, remove all frictions in the uh, you know, transaction and e-commerce transaction. And the web was, of course, a perfect place for this and, and enabled people to get together and, and form a community. And all the transactions are on the eBay, eBay models happening on the web. There's actually a lot of people, or a lot of sellers, who don't want that to happen. They want to get the, um, potential customers to come to them, for instance, call them. So one thing that we're working on now is to make it possible for, for buyers and sellers to talk to each other. Because that's, um, by talking to each other, can, can uh, um, easily you know, deal with things, complex products, but also to, to um, uh, drive potential customers to the sales departments of, um, uh, of sellers. And also, again, with a voice call so that you're calling, um, you, you're looking for products on, on eBay or one of the eBay sites or others for that matters, and you then um, you make a call from the web to that. Um, and and uh, how far successful. along are you in the in the deployment of that idea? Well, it's, it's kind of a, it's it's happening now. It's um, and so if I went on to eBay today, yeah. I could Skype somebody or, or, or yeah, you can do it in, in in some of the smaller marketplaces. And eBay has already been trying trying out. So you're you're in small markets, and, and you're going to roll it out globally. Is that is that that's you know that's the objective. But right now we're trying it out in in some smaller places. Now, as you as as this vision goes forward, what's on the roadmap for Skype? So 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 um, you know you started with the technology you were telling me this morning. Actually, like m many uh, uh, internet-enabled businesses, the business that Nicholas founded is not the business that he actually got into. Uh, to Eric's point, we kind of sometimes this we call it for feeling intellectual. We call it emergent. If you're feeling a little more just accurate, you might say we make it up as we go along. But but you started in a file transport kind of technology. So, is yeah. that right? Yeah. So I mean, the, the vision we had was that uh, a distributed, self-organizing peer-to-peer network would be the most efficient way to have to transfer data between end users because as, as we got more and more broadband connections uh, the whole client server model would be expensive and, and, and difficult to scale so we thought that was a, a vision of a, a disruptive technology that, that could enable different business models. We had no clue what the business model would be but we had very strong feeling about this powerful technology so we tried out several different business models then all of a sudden we realized that actually this would solve a lot of the problems with voice over the internet. And, and, and so going forward now, so we say, okay, we're there. Um, you solved this problem, uh, or at least you, you certainly made a, a very important step forward in this problem. Where are you going from here? So I think that there's a long way to go because um, uh, the vision that we have is that you know, everyone can talk for free, but it's not about just talking to each other because I think that's a, you know, a common mistake that one do is like, you don't want to invent, invent new technology just to replace something else. You need to make it better for the consumer, make it, you know, make it easier. And so I think the one thing that we're looking at very much is to look at conversations. So it's not only about voice, it's about combining voice, video, presence, text messaging, but also make it ubiquitous. Today is very PC-centric. You, know, you need to be able to, to use something like Skype wherever you are. And that's something that is becoming possible because others are building networks um, and, and you know you get mobile uh, Wi-Fi networks, um, 3G networks. So, so definitely. So Skype will go under the handset. Today it is a PC-enabled capability. Is that correct? Primarily PC-enabled, right. but it's going right. on the handset. Well. So, so, Bill, th th this, um, what is the impact on on like Microsoft Office and, and all those technologies, where now all of a sudden the communication stream is potentially part of the of the total uh, resource available? Has has that change the development agenda at Microsoft? Well, certainly, the, when you want to have a conversation, you want to have it about a topic. And the idea that you can take uh, the, you know, who you're going to call and immediately present the collaboration, the email, the calendar events, the notes that relate to that person you're going to talk to make a lot of sense. The fact that once you get them on the phone, maybe there's a business plan that's an Excel spreadsheet that you want to work on together uh, make various changes, see how it looks. 
you know, makes a lot of sense. So the idea that the communication stream is coming onto the PC lets us add value in a pretty dramatic way. Your contact list is going to be very rich in terms of indicating who you want to allow to interrupt you at various times and which device uh, you want to take that call on. Eventually you get rid of things like phone numbers and you even can take the logic that you might have uh, had to use an administrative assistant for or something and get that into the software so that everybody has that working on their, on their behalf. So there's a lot of change in that it's not just a phone call it, and the way it integrates into the office and collaboration software we do. And are you, in, in Microsoft itself, how, um, how active or, or where do you see yourself in terms of using these kind of capabilities to re-engineer or improve processes at Microsoft? Is that a high part of the agenda or is that just, how does it work? Well, we've got a product called Live Meeting, which is about being able to connect up PCs and show things to customers or work internally. And we've dramatically lowered the amount of travel we have to do because once you get to know somebody face to face, then there's a lot that can be done through this live meeting type capability. And so we're able to evangelize it to our customers very well just by you use it uh, yourself. showing it. And, and the adoption, this is another thing where the client is a free client. Uh, if you're just being connected to, you're not paying anything. You just click, download something, and boom, you're, you're connected up. So, so John, we, when we talk about this a lot in the tech sector, we talk about voice, data, and video. I, I think most of us don't have much imagination about what the video part is. I mean, I think we get it as consumers very quickly. But I think you, you've done some evangelizing at Cisco around video in a business context. Could you just share a little bit of your learnings from that? We originally communicated with our employees primarily by walking around. Then we began to use email. Uh, now my primary way used to be vi uh, voice. Now it's video on demand. And so literally these combinations are coming together. But going back and tying together Bill's point that he just made, we believe that if we were doing this panel five years from now, and maybe even quicker, it'll be like uh, Star Trek. It'll be Scotty beam me in here. And it will be the capability because of bandwidth uh, capabilities and lower price points that your interactions will be not only video with voice that works at the same speed on a PC like we see it today, but your ability to collaborate and have meetings in very unique ways. But if that's all you do and an IT professional or two or three of them have to set it up for you, it won't really take off. It's the ability to integrate it into your calendar and it's the ability to integrate it into your other processes and, and unite it. So what you're seeing is all of us head toward a common vision. But if I keep going back to a basic theme, you have to bet now for where the market's going to be three to five years out and identify those transitions that will occur. So what's the toughest bet you have to make right now? The toughest bet that I have to make right now is will the technologies be as tightly coupled as I believe they will be? In my terminology, a router, a switch, security, storage, IP telephony tied into the data center across networks in the home, service provider, right. and the enterprise. And we bet very heavily that that would be done with a, first a very loose architecture and a very tight architecture and that we could do what each of us strive to do, but very few tech companies do, which is to be a leader in more than one product area or two that have rapid growth and good gross margins. At the current time, we're in 10 product areas. We'll continue to do well if they really come together the way that we think. So that's the biggest bet we've made. And, and the bet is, 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 you think of the bet as a new product area? I mean, is that the way, classic way you make a bet? No. I think of the bet as an architectural change, a market transition that's mm -hmm. going to occur that enables convergence across a combination of networks, anytime, anywhere, any mode, data, voice, video, mobile or not. And then how does this occur? And then also how do you enable your business customers, your consumers to take advantage of this architecture? So thinking about a major use of that architecture, Eric, I want to go back to you. So this is a, a very compelling sentence that Google says, our job is to organize the world's information. Uh, we're pretty sure it's disorganized, so I, I think there's going to be quite a market. Um, but but what, help us understand the landscape here. So, so right now you have, you have this extremely far-reaching search capability. What, what's left to organize? What are the major chunks of information? How do you think about the world of information at large? How should we think about it? Well, um, there's books, <laughs> magazines, television. There's a lot of information that is not uh, yet fully available on Google. 
uh, we just introduced a product called video.google.com, um, which at least in its first rendition last year was, a, was the primary way or a primary way of taking the movies that people are making on digital cameras and putting them somewhere. And of course they have to be searched for and found because there's so many of them. If you then ext uh, extend that to things which people will purchase, you have the same metaphor, right? So it's a search, search metaphor. And so in Google, which is essentially a search company, searching through all that information is how we differentiate ourselves. Um, in video, uh, the, as the content comes over, people will be able to see whatever they want. They're going to have to f look for it and find it. That's search. So information here really means digital information. Do we have a decent paradigm for, do you have a, I mean, when I think of video search, how do I, I mean, what's my search argument other than the title of the video or something like that? I mean, how are you doing with, with, with visual search arguments, I guess is what you'd call them, or you know, well, how, how does that it's work? It's easy to start because most people know the name of the show that they watch. Okay. Um, although there may be some exceptions. Well, a whole movie might not have um, a name. Uh, and maybe sometimes that's good if you've seen the home movies. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> So, so usually there's a brand associated with it, okay, and usually so it's the first it, once, order once, once the brand is established, and it's easy. Most people want to see the most recent thing, for example. Okay. Um, and then if they have a historical argument, then they know the date or the subject or whatever. Okay. Um, so people are very, very good at looking for information if they know what they want to look for. So now I want to go back to the books, because it, as you know, there was a very visible uh, interaction between, between you and, 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 and the, the caretakers and custodians of the books. Where, and there was, a, there was a kind of a, we'd like to organize all the books in the world, and, and a, there was a sort of a pushback against that. So where, to kind of describe both sides of that pushback and kind of where it is and where you think it might evolve to over the next few years. Well, one of the rules here is that you have to represent the, the rights of copyright holders. And because these people work very hard and they need to be appropriately compensated. In the case of our library activities, um, we are in the process of making uh, transient copies to build an index to the books. We do not, in fact, show the book. It's not possible to even print out a page of the book. And what we hope will, will happen is that over time, authors and publishers will, will discover that it's much more interesting from a business to have people actually purchasing books that they see references to rather than having them occasionally go to the libraries, which are, are less and less the way in which they get information. So it's bringing, bringing that technology to it. In parallel with all of those publishers, we have business relationships where we actually will show one or two or three pages of the book, and then there's a click to buy from any of the online stores. That business is very strong. So what's interesting is that if, you're, if you don't really know what you're looking for, and you're interested in a subject or whatever, there needs to be a certain amount of leeway in navigating to find what book has that information. Um, if you know the book, or if you're told where the book is, then it's very easy now to buy them. The same metaphor books are easy, can be applied to virtually any kind of content. So uh, as, as we're doing this, I'm going to uh, ask one more question around public policy, and then I'm going to throw it open to the audience so that you can uh, have a chance to have the pleasure that I've been having for the last 45 minutes, which is asking questions to some of the brightest people in the sector. Um, if the, the, the question I want to pose to the panel, John, I'm going to start with you and kind of just work, work straight down, is in the midst of all this, um, uh, I think, very optimistic language around what technology-enabled businesses can, can do for the world. What do you think is the most important public policy issue to get right in order for us to get the maximum benefit from this opportunity? I'd come at it maybe a little bit different way than you can expect, Jeffrey. To me, if you believe that the future of countries or companies depend upon the combination of education, how effective is the infrastructure build out, innovation, and supportive government, which I do believe, uh, I think the most important public policy issue is for government leaders, whether they're regulators, uh, leaders of the countries, or leaders of the defense or security or whatever segment that they have, is to really gain an understanding of what technology can do for them. And then they make the right decisions on regulation, or they make the right decisions about how to interface with the citizen, the right decision about education, or the right uh, decision about security, et cetera. So I think the most important public policy issue is what you're seeing here at World Economic Forum, which is government leaders coming and learning and, and beginning to understand what technology can do to not only enable their strategy, but perhaps to determine what their strategy should be. Just to, just to get a little more specific and say the next year or so, Cisco uh, it, it does have some presence in Washington. You, you do have dialogues with, with legislature. Um, is there a particular item on the agenda, either in the US or, or maybe, maybe it's in a different part of the world, which needs attention in an interesting way, like 
soon? Um, I think all of us here on this panel have a common focus on education. Okay. I'm a believer our education system in the U.S. is broken, K through 12. It needs radical reform. Uh, together at World Economic Forum, we did the Jordan Education Initiative with 17 companies working toward that. Transformed not only Jordan's education, but created an opportunity for jobs, venture capital. They've got an economy that's now growing at 7% per year. King of Dell and Queen Rania would probably say this group played a major role in it. Uh, the policy issue in the U.S. is we need a radical change. And what we did was, rather than try to go through Washington when a terrible event happened with Katrina, uh, we partnered and, and went with the Mississippi Education Initiative to where literally with the governor, with the superintendent of schools, seven school districts, 50,000 students, we're going to attempt to allow the U.S. education system not only be built back in Mississippi where it was destroyed, but to build one for the future. So we literally are going to develop curriculum. Uh, we're going to wire the communities so that there is no digital divide within the area. We'll make the teachers the implementer of this plan. Uh, we will reward $500,000 grants to be able to develop the curriculum within it and work toward a common goal to, to change education. So I think education is the most important public policy issue. And that's certainly a resource to the technology community. Uh, the way you were describing it, it sounded like the, the, the Cisco's particular expertise at networking was, was a useful tactic, but that this was more of a social responsibility interaction than necessarily a policy for technology-enabled business. Is that, is that fair? I think it's not that easy to break apart, but the concept's fair. Okay. Okay. Well, well, Bill, how about yourself? What do you think is the single most important? I mean, all of this, you know, this is a very um, public policy accessible, I mean, a lot of public policy decision gets influenced by the folks in the room. What's the most important issue to focus on and what do we need to get right? For the technology sector? Yeah, I, I really do want to do it for the technology sector. Okay. I, I do, I do. Well, that helps. Uh, I'd certainly agree with John. Education would be right at the top of the list. If you take the locations where innovative companies have sprung up all over the world, it's definitely where the great educational centers are. That's where the, the thinking is, is going on. And every country will compete to do that well. And there's certainly a need for renewal in this country uh, to, to drive that uh, to big levels, and that's something that uh, you know I've, I've gotten involved with a great deal through the foundation I have. I'd say you want to couple it with continuing to emphasize uh, research funding, science programs, engineering as, as being attractive, and there uh, some countries have big fall-offs in those numbers, and some have big, big increases, and so that could lead to uh, disparate results. Uh, there's a few things about free trade, uh, letting the country bring very smart people in, not having visa restrictions against that. Uh, there's intellectual property issues in some countries. So I'd say all of those come up. You know, if the free trade system broke down, that would be bad for all uh, business and technology, I think, would suffer in particular. So we've got action items across I'd say each of those four things. You know, you mentioned this morning, too, I, for those of us who got up at 7 o'clock in the morning, Tom Friedman and Bill Gates held one of the great conversations. Um, but one of the things that was coming out of that was, and it's noted all frequently at Davos, um, the, the number of science and engineering, you know, graduates in, 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 in the U.S., and it's not just U.S., it's U.S. and Europe, is going down as the, as the ones in Asia are coming up. Just, and that's, we, we say that all the time. Do you have any understanding of why in, in say, the U.S., because that's where your home base is, wh why isn't there more interest in what obviously interests you and interests a lot of people? What's going on? Well, the, there's a lot of studies that we've funded and work with other people on this, but I'd still say it's, it's basically mysterious because if you say to kids, hey, what's cool, they'll say, you know, iPods or Google search or yeah. Xbox or their phone. You know, they know, they don't say it's uh, wheat trading or stock brokerage <laughs> or uh, bread manufacturing. I want to grow up and be a, uh, <laughs> a benefits consultant. Know, they know that the kind of neat changing thing, whether it's education, healthcare, or just gadgets for them to uh, do fun things, is coming out through software enablement and that software's on this verge of all the breakthroughs that have been discussed for the last 20 or 30 years, the speech recognition, visual recognition, the ability to, to software enable everything. And so when you say, hey, this is the coolest time, uh, we actually pay pretty good salaries and you get to work with other smart people, you'd think uh, that would be attractive. There's certainly some mistakes made in the curriculum that makes it kind of daunting 
uh, particularly unattractive for women. Uh, you don't see the payoff, so it's a little bit like we say, cross the desert, uh, and you're going to go through a lot of math. You don't know why you're learning. It's not well motivated. That's a very big thing on the, the, the 1,500 high schools the foundation is funded is to deal with this relevance issue, and they, and they do that through uh, themed high schools. You know, the themes can be uh, anything, art, construction, makes it outward bound, something that you can only teach them enough, uh, say math, to solve how, how do you want to bid to make this a house or make sure it doesn't fall down. And uh, there's some work going on at Princeton about taking these boundaries of the curriculum and changing them in a pretty dramatic way that I think are fairly exciting, but uh, it's, it's somewhat unexplained. In India, it's easy to understand why engineers are uh, that's an attractive thing because they see that's the role model where the, the neat jobs, the great salaries have been created. So they've got a virtuous cycle that's, that's kicked in there. Makes sense. So Eric, let me ask you now. So in terms of public policy, lots of places it could focus. What do you think is the, is the area that we need to get right in the reasonably short term relative to technology that will create the best, the best outcomes? Um, the one that's going to come next, I think, is going to be the issue of the rights and responsibilities of governments and citizens and all the various other players with respect to people's lives online. We now, because we have GPS-enabled phones, uh, we can search things, we can build these massive uh, repositories and so forth, we managed to collect a lot of information, whether we, it was deliberate or not, and exactly who has access to that, what the rights are, the issues of identity theft, and so forth, are going to loom very, very large in the end user's mind, in the citizen's mind. Um, governments, uh, in, for example, in, the, in Europe there's a European data initiative, uh, there's a number of such initiatives around the world, and they don't agree. And these are issues not just of politics, but also of culture, uh, of rights, and so forth. Um, and one of the things that could significantly slow down this very ro rosy picture is bizarre or unreasonable laws, regulations, or fear on the part of end users who are, dis who are dying to use these things but are afraid for whatever reason. I, I will say that, to, to all, and I agree with, with what um, John and Bill have already said, one of the places to look to see where we're going to get a lot of learning is in the Asian usage mo model. Asians, uh, as a uh, if you make a broad statement, are using mobile phones a lot more than anything else. They're using them in clever and interesting ways. There's a lot of new, very interesting applications being built in those markets. They have a tremendous techno technological advantage and distribution advantage in, in many cases. Um, so one of the ways in which our, our world is going to be sort of moderated is because we're going to see innovation coming from places that we have historically not expected it. Do you, do, to what degree do you think the identi I mean, identity theft happens to be one of those phrases that strikes fear into virtually everyone's heart? So it's a, to what degree is that an issue of public policy? To what degree is that an issue of, of technology solutions? I mean, how do you see the balance there? Well, in fact, it's both. And, uh, uh, Various governments are enacting all sorts of laws about this, are busy pr prosecuting the worst offenders, et cetera. And there are many good technological solutions coming along. Um, so again, it's more the fear that causes people to withhold. We talked about e-commerce, electronic commerce, five, six, seven years ago. It took a long time for people to actually believe that their Christmas presents were going to show up without their, their, Christmas, their uh, credit card being stolen and roughly on time. Right? That, in and of itself, changed the industry. So there's a kind of a performance norm that just has to have a certain amount of time. People have to become acculturated, and the quicker we can get people to be comfortable, the quicker these businesses can grow. So, Nicholas, from your point of view, again, what do you think is the most important public policy issue to get right in order to, uh, for us to benefit in this technology-enabled future? As, as you said, uh, Jeff, in the, in the beginning, that the technology industry is now touching so many other industries, if that is you know, use, use, um, telecommunications, media, entertainment, whatsoever. So what happens is it becomes very complex issues to deal with because you have regulations and, and laws and um, uh, spectrum allocations for, which are back, dated from a, uh, a very long time back with, when we had different types of technologies. And also back when technologies and, and were very much predictable, it was easier to understand how would a mobile phone network work? And, and over 10 or 15 or 20 years, we're going to have this type of mobile phone networks and we allocate frequencies. This is how a telecommunications regulations would work. Now, 
the, the, the landscape is different. We have completely different type of technologies solving similar pro problems. And all these industries and our, or the technology industry are now touching all these other industries. What's important is that um, policymakers, if that is from you know, regulations or if it's um, um, allocation of frequencies and, 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 and other things, should make this, the danger is that if those um, uh, we're applying those you know policies regulations that was constructed for all technologies because that's going to be it's going to hinder uh, the evolution and, and uh, uh, creation creation of, of new technologies new, new new opportunities. The other thing is is, is, is um, the cross border nature of, of this because the the internet is now clearly a global network and has no borders and policies made in one country has impacts on others. So, so I think it's, so it's, it's a challenge, I think, for policymakers to set policies which are global. So I think that, and there's also an increased competition, obviously. So there's, a, there's probably a less um, need for um, re, um, regulations. I think that more and more hands-off approaches, but making sure that you're protecting some basic consumer rights, like obviously privacy becomes extremely important, as Serge pointed out. But I think that that's, that, that's probably okay. the most important. So I'm gonna, let me summarize what I think. I, I'm taking away three vectors that I think um, are, are, are things that every one of us in this room sh should be watching about in our, in our sector. Um, one of them is the digitization of everything. So, so all of a sudden, as, as the world becomes represented in a digital structure, it changes business models. Information about the world becomes sometimes more valuable than the asset in the world itself. And thinking about digitization, I think, is huge. I think this, the second issue about this issue of going from transaction to interaction, which I think is the convergence of communication and computing. So that so the, communication is fundamentally interactive, and computing came from a transactive heritage, and the notion of those two things coming together. What would that do to your What would that do to your business? What would that do to to the, to your world, to education, to healthcare? Some of the things that, that John and Bill and and, and, and folks here have talked about. And, and the third thing is this notion that this extraordinary thing that the tech sector has had almost from birth, which is that things become free, or they don't really become free. As, as Bill pointed out, there's always a business there. But if it's $30 a month for the world, as opposed to $30 a month for four channels, you know, that's a pretty good $30, right? And, and so asymptotically, it starts approaching free. And so a business or a community that does not take advantage of, the, of, of, free, of a free resource leaves itself at a com at, at minimum, a competitive disadvantage and potentially an opportunity disadvantage, or, or at least they're leaving opportunities on the table going forward. So the notion that, that, that if you think about computing as free, if you think about transaction interaction, if you think about the digitization of everything, those are at least the three that I'm taking away. Now, I'd like to, at this point, turn the opportunity to uh, interrogate these gentlemen over to you. And I'm going to see a hand here, and we'll just, we'll just bring the, the things. And, and if we can bring up the lights in the, in, the, in the other part a tiny bit, or maybe they are and I'm just blind. And could you, again, could you just you know, introduce yourself and, and uh, are we going to? No, OK. Um, if you just introduce yourself and, and then ask the question. Uh, my name is Sohail Seth. I'm from India. I run an advertising business. My question is to Eric. I'm a bit confused if a business model, like a search model, is based in the manner it is because it is, there is a paradox to privacy. That's one. Two, my concern is when does a sale business, a search business become a sale enterprise? You know, there are going to be occasions when people are going to use the search engine as the driver to then perhaps complete okay. a sale. Okay, and you so know, there's a paradox there okay. as well. So okay. if you could have, uh, if you could comment on that. We have, have resolved that very clearly by our own policy where the advertising results are, not, are ranked by advertiser relationships, an auction process, et cetera, and the core results of Google are not influenced by the relationships we have with advertisers. This editorial uh, separation has allowed us to build the advertising relationships and make them more powerful, easier to conclude, quicker, and so forth and so on, but maintain and, in fact, show that our results are unbiased. And, and this, this is a pretty classic media model of editorial yeah. you know, and advertising. No, not, a, not unlike uh, the traditional models. Okay. All right. Yes, a question back here. Mm, 
My question is to Mr. Bill Gates and has to do with education. Oh, and you are? My name is Jacques Markovic from Brazil. I'm a, I'm a professor. So uh, uh, my question is the following. Do you think that overexposure to uh, digital connections might inhibit entrepreneurial attitudes? Uh, do you think that if I see my students sometimes so much of exposed that they get detached from the real, real world. They have the impression that they find the real world through the internet. Right. That's a great question. That so, they, they detach from uh, the construction right. system. That's right. great. So th this notion of the digital, th does the digital reality and somehow take over in a way that's counterproductive? Yeah, that, that problem came up with books. Uh, you know, when books came along, there was a lot of concern that people were reading instead of uh, going and doing things. And the word bookworm was almost a, a derogatory term. Uh, certainly it applied to me. Uh, and it turned out okay. You know, I didn't think it, it, I don't know if okay, I did turn out to be an entrepreneur. Uh, and so I don't know, I, all these things are in moderation. I do think if you take passive TV watching versus uh, using the internet to go out and find things and see things, that that interactivity element is better, uh, that it's, it's more enriching uh, than other things. But you don't want someone to stay away from books or the computer altogether. You don't want them to stay away from outdoor play and activity altogether. I do think the, I envy the kids growing up today in terms of anytime they're curious about things, they can find things out. And it, yeah, so it's a cool. wonderful way so. to, to not let your curiosity die, to think, okay, I can figure this out. I can put these pieces together. So I'd say even if you balance out uh, whatever drawbacks there are, it's 100 times more empowering than, than whatever we had before. Fair enough. Other questions? Here? Right here? And then, and then you'll be next. Hi, Carl Heinz. Hi, I'm Stephen Johnson. I'm the author most recently of a book called Everything Bad is Good for You, which is partially a defense of video games. And I, it's interesting uh, that gaming really didn't come up thus far. Uh, Bill mentioned the Xbox, but you know, I think for anybody under 25, it's really driving most of their media use and technology. So two questions very quickly. One, do you guys play games? And secondly, uh, in terms of education, do you see uh, some use for okay. applying the kind of structures of gameplay to, to okay. schools? I'd like the, the second one to get the most answers. Just a quick, uh, do you play games, Nicholas? I don't, I don't uh, have Eric? time. No. I don't. I do. Yep. I, John. Learned, I learned how to fly. You learned how to fly. <laughs> okay, you learned how to fly. Okay, but now I think that this question about, Jen, John, let me start with you. So, because you're interested in education, we were talking about that just a minute ago. Do you think there's a relationship between the game and the things we're learning from the gaming industry and education? I really do. If you think back to the Jordan Education Initiative as an example, uh, the way we get young people, Bill, interested in math and science in kindergarten, first and second grade was using computer games delivered over the network in Arabic that allowed them to learn math and science kindergarten, first and second. It got the girls, the boys equally as excited. So I think actually it really enhances your learning and it, it allows you to make it fun at the same time then they don't, you don't lose them in 6th and 8th grade like we, we do today. So, so, Bill, I mean, Xbox, when you hear about it, of course, it's, it's all about, you know, these way cool, you know, uh, video experiences, uh, which in and of itself, as far as I'm concerned, is fine. Is there, is there a, another agenda around the education thing with Xbox, or is it just, just let the market do what it does? Well, first, I think this book uh, is one people should read pretty broadly. It's... it's it's, and the title it's, again it's, is Everything Bad is... Everything that's bad, bad for it, you it, is good. Did I get that right? Uh, Everything is bad is good for you? All right. And it's, it's so counterintuitive, and yet I think it makes a very compelling case that, about this. And it really does fit in with what our foundation has found in the educational sector, which is a lot of the failure to achieve is not challenging the kids enough, not making it interesting enough. And so paradoxically, when you make it tougher, you get a higher level of engagement. Xbox is taking the, the involvement to a new level by having this live capability to compete with other people, to watch the best players, to enter into contests. The only reason I don't talk about it a lot is after I, if I talk about Xbox on a panel, everybody comes up and says, how do I get one? Sure. Because uh, we still yeah, can't a little make behind. it. Uh, <laughs> but six months from now, uh, I may not have that problem. You know, that's a problem with hardware. You should think maybe more about software. You know. well, yeah. <laughs> Carl Heinz? 
Carl Heinz, by the way, is one of the tech pioneers uh, uh, here who's, uh, I've been having a chance over the last two days to work with the tech pioneers. I have to say it's the single best institution I work with at Davos. I'm just really proud of him. Go ahead. Yeah, my name is Karl-Heinz Land. Thank you, George, for introducing him. Um, and I have a question for Bill and for Nicholas. Actually, I heard from Bill, he's mentioning voice recognition, uh, visual recognition. Nicholas is speaking about voice portals. Uh, do you believe with the change from IP world, telecommunication, uh, what's happening right now that uh, the networks becomes commoditized for the telco carriers? Do you think that really this is the start for, let's say, a vocal net, a voice web? So we will see that in addition to the existing internet? Could I, Nicholas, I'd like you to start for yeah. just a so, so first of all, definitely not a, a commoditization of, of, of networks. I think that, as we talked about before, that, that obviously like uh, bandwidth per se is something that's going to be free, but you're paying for the access. And with regards to, you know, this you know, term of the, the voice, internet, or whatever, I think that's like, it's not like either or. I think that's, uh, it's all about how do you interact with a network different times. For instance, if you're driving a car, it's not a good idea to be working with a laptop. One of our guys did that and he had a car accident. <laughs> and it's much better to talk to the internet then. But then of course it's very limited. It's much more of a challenge to, to get that interface. But I think to, for some limited things it's, it's definitely a good idea. But and, and, so I don't think it's an easy or And before I give it to did, Eric, is there any voice enabled um, search initiatives at Google? Um, we've looked at it. Uh, and it's hard because of the ambiguity of language. You can do um, very good uh, answers on train sets with specific categories. It's very hard to do it in general for everyone all the time. W one part, partial answer to your question is that if there is a voice net, it'll be a part of the internet. Okay. Yeah, I, I agree with all those comments. Voice is a, a form of input that you'll mix together. And so, you know, the unified inbox where your voicemail, your email comes in, to get in there together. Uh, the ability to do the recognition, uh, that's a, a key element because you want to be able to see it up on the screen. And so there's just a lot of work going into that and constant progress that's actually bringing it into, into the mainstream. By knowing the context, by doing automatic user training, I do think that that will be a, a very mainstream thing, but not as a separate uh, mode of interaction. Okay. Another question right here. Pass it along. Hi, I'm Ed Scott. I used to be in high tech a long time ago. <laughs> Are you recovering? <laughs> I am. Okay. I just wanted to ask Eric if he'd comment on both sides of his recent uh, uh, issues in China. Um, we, we take our mission for all the world very seriously, and China has you know, one-fifth of the world's population. In looking at the legal structure and the restrictions that are placed on media companies, and we fall in that category under Chinese law, we concluded that although we weren't wild about the restrictions, it was even worse to not s try to serve those users at all. There's so many of them, and they, do, they have so many interesting things going on. And so we made a deliberate decision to, uh, to make sure we comply with local law. It's not an option for companies anywhere to violently disobey the laws of the countries that they operate in. So our only other choice was to not en enable at all. And we felt that it was a much greater sort of bad thing uh, not to at least attempt to help participate in, in the amazing things going on in China. And, and Eric, you know, Google's famous for this sort of uh, credo around do no evil. So did, did that come up in your discussions? Yes, we, we actually did an evil scale and we decided that not serving at all was worse evil I'm serious. I, 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 uh, I, 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 and be, be, because, and we spent a great deal of time discussing this. It, yeah. it took us about a year to make this decision. But that's do less evil. <laughs> that, is it, do, you, do you agree with that, by the way? I mean, I, mean, I, would, I actually would agree with what Bill said. You're choosing a lesser evil, right? I think this is a semantic question. The, okay. fact, of the, ma the fact of the matter is, no, no, no. But I mean, no, no, uh, I, I, don't I, caught, I don't want to be caught in the rhetoric. No, 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 no okay, okay. This is an important principle that Google has run for the end users. And there's an awful lot of end users in China who, in our, you know, perhaps biased judgment, would like to use our products. No, I, I, I uh, and, and, and I think that's that, that is at least a principled decision. T Tom Friedman actually had a great. He, he actually had four different reactions, and, and he, they kind of spanned the entire group. And he was he was trying to decide. He's going to write a column about it. So look for Tom Friedman in the Times because I think he's 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 kind of trying to sort that out. It's we're coming to the end. If there's, uh, 
I think what I'm going to do is just take this opportunity to thank my panelists and thank all of you. Thank you very much, gentlemen. This was a great, a great hour and a quarter. Thank you.